Good afternoon. And welcome to UNC Asheville. This is a beautiful sight to see. I first want to welcome you and thank, first of all, Mr. Jerome Hughes, who's in the audience. And um, if it had not been for him, this audience wouldn't be gathered here today. And I know he put in an extreme amount of energy to get this um, program to come to be today. And I'm extremely grateful to him. This is a, uh, one of the special programs we've had for Black History Month. Um, and we are celebrating today, our celebration is surrounded around the Tuskegee Airmen. And our panelists today, um, our keynote speaker stepped out for a moment, but he will return in just a second. Um, yes, Mr. Leonard Hawk Hunter. I just want to give you a brief bio on Mr. Hunter. He was born and reared in East Raleigh, North Carolina. He attended Lucille Hunter Elementary School, as well as Washington and J.W. Ligon High Schools. After graduating from J.W. Lincoln High School in 1955, he enlisted in the United States Air Force. Mr. Hunter retired after serving almost 24 years in 1978. He received an Associate of Arts degree from Miami-Dade Community College and a Bachelor of Professional Studies degree from Barry University. He's a member of Delta Epsilon National Honor Society. Mr. Hunter currently serves on the boards and um, one of the boards is the New Bern Avenue Daycare Center and Family and Youth Incorporated as active, an active member of St. Paul AME Zion Church, I'm sorry, no, it's AME Church in Raleigh. He is a part of the transportation ministry, driving the church fans. His community service involvement includes, but is not limited to, to a senior counselor for the city of Raleigh summer youth program, a lecturer of African American history throughout the city of Raleigh, Wake County, and throughout the states of North Carolina and South Carolina. He has lectured all over the states, and Mr. Hunter has a local TV show uh, and is the spokesman for the Wilson B. Eagleston chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated of North Carolina. He is employed as a substitute teacher in the Wake County school system. Mr. Hunter, his honors and awards include holding the office of treasurer and president, respectively, of the Archivas of Greater Miami Incorporated. He has produced and has hosted Profiles and Achievements and Let's Talk Miami, two television programs as well as the Community Hour radio show in Miami, Florida. He is a recipient of the Second Episcopal District AME Church Man of the Year Award and Sons of Thunder. And you are in for a great treat today. His colleagues with him uh, from Mr. Hunter's left is Mr. David Shore. He is retired Navy, Master Chief Petty Officer. Is that the wrong one? Okay, sorry. Got it backwards. Robert Cardill, thank you, is retired Navy Master Chief Petty Officer. He's on the end here. 25 years retired, Vietnam vet, both Libyan conflict and Grenada conflict. First Gulf War, VFW, American Legion veteran for <clears throat> and foreign, uh, foreign wars. And he's district um, American veteran uh, with the, he's also associated with the Wilson B. Eagleston chapter as well. And to his right uh, is Mr. Um, David Shore. He is the host commander of American Legion 336. He's District 18 commander of North Carolina American Legion. And he's a member of the Wilson B. Eagleston, Eagleston uh, chapter as well, and also a Vietnam vet. Please, let's give a hand to these gentlemen. And thank you so much for joining us today. And without uh, further ado, you are really, again, as I said before, really in for a treat for Mr. Leonard Hawk Hunter. Please welcome him. Good afternoon. I'm at a little disadvantage because of our television crew here. Now, ordinarily, people that would come up and speak would stand behind a podium I don't do that, and there's a very good reason, and I like to tell people why. Number one, I like to move around. I have what speakers call happy feet, and I like to come out and go out there, and as we say, we used to say in the military, I want to go out there amongst you, see what you're doing. But today I have to stand here, but I don't stand beside, behind a podium because people tend to think that you are a preacher. Now, I'm a lot of things, 
but a preacher I'm not. Because of that, I do not go into any pulpit and I speak at hundreds of thousands of churches. And the reason for that is my grandmama told me when I was about 10 years old, she said, boy, she always called me that boy. She knew my name better than I did. She said, boy, I don't want to ever see you in a pulpit unless you're a preacher. And to this day, 70 years later, I have not been in a pulpit, even my own church. So that's why you see me. I don't stand behind a podium. I'd like to thank you today and uh, fellas on the cameras and young lady. Uh, if I get fidgety up here, just bear with me because I ain't used to standing here. You know, being a Vietnam vet, you don't want to stand too long, do we, Bob? Because, Bob and Dave, you get to be a target. So you like to kind of move around, you know, and duck. <laughs> I'd like to thank you for coming and for Miss Wiggins inviting us here. I'm here to tell you a story about some very important people, people that are part of your history as they are a part of American history, not just black history, American history. Because you see, these people were Americans. I'm an American. I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud to be able to walk this land like my forefathers did. I'm American by birth. I'm African by ancestry. And I walk this land, which is mine, like the descendants of the great kings and queens of Africa that I come from. But I'm proud to be an American. I fought for it, and if I have to, I'll die for it. And that was the reason for the Tuskegee Airmen to become who they are today. Back in 1941, we were getting ready to fight a great war. And we, as African Americans, uh, no, that's wrong. I'm going to use the terminology that they called us then. We were not called African Americans. We were not called blacks. We were called colored people. We were called Negroes. We wanted to go and fight for our country, but we didn't want to go and fight as a cook. We didn't want to go and fight as somebody that cut the grass and mopped the floors. We wanted to be fighter pilots. But America said, you're not smart enough to be fighter pilots. They said colored men were cowards. They said colored men were lazy. And when things got rough, that we'd run and hide. So they said you weren't capable of being a fighter pilot. Well, to prove that, Congress hired anthropologists and scientists. And they did a study, or so they said. And in this study, this is what they came up with to tell Congress why we couldn't be pilots. They said the colored man's brain was too small and the blood vessels in his brain could not bring enough blood pumped by his heart to his brain, and if he got above a certain height in an airplane, he would black out. I spent over 24 years in the Air Force. I was never a pilot, but I flew on just about all the things you can think of. And you know a strange thing we found out? That if you get in an airplane and you get above a certain height, if you don't pressurize the cabin that you're riding in like you do in a regular commercial airliner, or if you don't put on that oxygen mask to breathe that oxygen when you get above a certain, you're going to black out. And it ain't got nothing to do with the color of your skin. And then they said, we colored men we were not coordinated enough 
to fly or fight an airplane. They said we couldn't operate the control stick, we call it the joystick. We couldn't operate the joystick and the rudder pedals with our feet at the same time. Let me give it to you another way. They said we couldn't walk and chew chewing gum at the same time. Can you believe telling somebody like Michael Jordan he's not coordinated enough to dunk a basketball? That's what they were saying. Well, we proved them wrong. Well, after much lobbying by Congress, lobbying to Congress by our leaders and our colored newspapers, Congress decided to give us a chance. Congress decided to start a program called the Tuskegee Experiment. Now, for you students sitting here, as you go through high school and college, you're going to do experiments. And you expect those experiments to succeed to give you a good feeling. Well, this experiment was supposed to fail. It was started to fail to prove to America that colored men could not fly. So they took about 33, 35 men and about 300 others and they took them to a little school in Alabama called Tuskegee Institute. And there they were gonna train these men to become pilots. Now, for those of you who know a little bit about American history, you know Tuskegee Institute was started by a gentleman by the name of Booker T. Washington. But there was another great man there at Tuskegee, the greatest scientist that this country has ever seen. And I don't care what you read in any book or what anybody tells you, there was never a scientist greater than this gentleman right here. A gentleman by the name of Dr. George Washington Carver. And we all know what he invented, don't we? Peanut butter. Yeah. Well, I still eat peanut butter today. And if I hadn't been here in beautiful Asheville, North Carolina, I'd have had some this morning for breakfast in Raleigh. Well, he did a lot more than just peanut butter. And I want you to stop to think about that. You put mayonnaise on your sandwiches. Dr. George Washington Carver. The linoleum on the floor that you walk on, Dr. George Washington Carver. The shoe polish that you use to shine your shoes, Dr. George Washington Carver. And hundreds more. So look them up. Dr. Carver was there. And once they got the Tuskegee Airmen there, they began to train them. And as they were training them, they, they got a number of them trained and they formed what was called the 99th Pursuit Squadron. And they changed the name to the 99th Fighter Squadron. Well, there was a special man in that first class. There were 13 in that first class. And they only let five graduate. Because you see, we had a quota system even then. They weren't going to let too many of them colored men, colored boys as they were called, be pilots. So only five graduated. Of that five, none are left alive today. But there was a very special man there, a gentleman by the name of Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. B.O., we affectionately called him behind his back because B.O. Davis was six foot three, ramrod straight, and he went on to become our first black three-star general in the Air Force, and he didn't play that. So affectionately, we called him B.O. where he couldn't hear us. B.O. Davis went to West Point. He went there for five years, and for five years, not one member of the Corps cadet spoke to him. Five years. Nobody in his class spoke to him. The only people that spoke to B.O. Davis were the instructors. Do you think you could go to school for five years and nobody speak to you? He took his meals by himself. He studied by himself. He exercised by himself. And he graduated in the top 1% of the class. He made it. Because, you see, B.O. Davis had a dream about 20 years before Dr. Martin Luther King had his dream. And B.O. Davis says, I'm going to be a fighter pilot. And he did. Well, after they had trained enough of those colored boys, 
They formed the 99th Fighter Squadron, but they wouldn't let them go overseas to fight. Why? They were as good as anybody else, but they wouldn't let them go. Because, you see, all of the generals that commanded the fighting squadrons overseas were white generals. And they didn't want these colored boys flying for them. But you know what? We had a very special friend in Washington, D.C., a special lady, the first lady of the land, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. And the Tuskegee Airmen affectionately called her Miss Eleanor. And Miss Eleanor believed in the Tuskegee Airmen. And she said, them colored boys can fly. So Miss Eleanor gets in her plane and she flies to Tuskegee. And when she gets there, she walked into the room and sitting there on the front row was one of the instructor pilots that was there at the time. They had finally gotten some colored boys, instructor pilots. This gentleman's name was Chief Anderson. And Miss Eleanor walked over to Chief Anderson. She looked down at him and she said, can colored boys fly? And Chief Anderson looked up at her and smiled and said, yes, ma'am, we sure can. Would you like to go for a ride? And Miss Eleanor says, I sure would. So they get up and they go out and get in Miss Eleanor's chauffeur-driven car and they drive out to the flight line. And they're going to get in the plane. It's a two-seater called a Sturman. Now I want you to stay with me here because this is important. Miss Eleanor gets in the back. Do you get the significance of that? Miss Eleanor gets in the back seat. Chief Anderson is the pilot. He gets in the front seat. He fires up the Sturman. He taxes out, and he's getting ready to go. Now, we all know that the president and his family, including his wife, is guarded by the Secret Service. There was two or three Secret Service guys standing over there, and Chief is taxiing out. Now, remember, there's two seats. Miss Eleanor is in the bag, and Chief is flying the plane. Where are they going to sit? There won't no room for them. So Chief takes off, and off he goes into the wild blue yonder. And these boys are left standing over there with egg on their face. Well, first thing they do, they run to the telephone. They call Washington, D.C. Now, let me explain something to you. Some of the older ladies and gentlemen sitting here can relate to this. Back in during those times, if you had a problem, you call Washington, D.C., Today, when you have a problem, you call Houston, Texas. Y'all get the significance? Do you know you've heard, Houston, we got a problem. There you go. Okay. <laughs> well, they call the president of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Mr. Roosevelt come on the line. He said, what is it? He said, Mr. President, we got a problem. He said, okay. What is the problem? He said, Miss Eleanor is up flying around the skies of Alabama with one of them colored flyers. What are we going to do? And the President of the United States thought for a minute, and he told him, he said, you're going to do exactly what I'm going to do. You're going to sit there and wait till she comes back. Because that's Miss Eleanor, and she does what she wants to do. Well, a few minutes later, about 15, 20 minutes later, Chief flies back in, he taxes down, helps Miss Eleanor off the plane. She said, I enjoyed the ride. Now, all officials like that have aides. Officials have aides, military aides that knows things or supposed to know things anyway. Well, her aide was a four-star army general. That's the highest rank you can get in the military, four stars. This boy is supposed to know it all. Miss Eleanor walks over to him and she said, now, General, I want you to tell me why these boys here are not overseas defending their country. If you have been in the military any time longer than 20 minutes, we know that four-star generals are not too bright. They don't know too many things. Old sergeants like me and David and Bob and chiefs and all like that, we are the brains. We have to teach them things. When they want to know something, come to Sergeant, can you get it? Yes, we can take care of that for you, General. Well, 
That general was no different. He didn't know. So he stood there and he told Miss Eleanor, uh, Miss Roosevelt, I'm sorry, I don't know why they are not overseas. Miss Eleanor gets in her plane and she flies back to Washington, D.C. And that night she sits down with the president. Now you young folks here are going to learn a fact of life that you already know. All of you know it. And all of the grown-ups sitting here that are married, have been married, especially the men, you know it too. And that fact of life is, your father does not run the family. <laughs> he don't. And if you don't believe it, when you go home tonight and your mama is standing there with you, ask him and see what he tells you. And if he's got any brains in his head at all, he's going to look at the wife, well, yeah, yes, dear. <laughs> And if you, you know, you young ladies, especially the young ladies, these hard-head boys over here, they, they don't, you know, they don't do that too much. But now these cute little young ladies sitting around here, I know what y'all do, see, when you want to go and hang out a little late, or you want to go to a party that you know you ain't got no business going to anyway, who do you go ask? You go ask your mama. Now, my daughter was a little different. She played it both hands against the middle. She would come to me and she said, uh, <clears throat> Daddy, can I talk to you a minute? I said, uh-oh. She wants one or two things. She wants some of my money or she wants to go somewhere. <laughs> and she said, well, Daddy, I'd like to go such and such a place. Is that okay? And like most fathers with their brains in their head, what do we tell them, dads? Go ask your mama. That's right. Well, the President of the United States won't know different. He's a man just like the rest of us. So that evening when Miss Eleanor sat down with him, you know, those of us who know a little bit about American history, we know that President Roosevelt used to have what we call fireside chats. They were famous. He broadcast from the fireside chats. Well, he had a fireside chat with Miss Eleanor, but that didn't get broadcast. And Miss Eleanor sat down and she put her head on his shoulder and she began to talk to him real sweet. Y'all lay married leaders. Y'all know how y'all do. You know, when you want that mink coat or that new dress, and you sit down there and you whisper in his ear, dear, and you begin to talk to him a little bit, guess what? You get your dress, you get your coat. Well, the president was no different. And after Miss Eleanor finished talking to him, guess what? 90 days later, the Tuskegee Airmen were on their way overseas to defend their country. And thus began a legend that has never been equal by any fighter squadron in this country, by any fighter squadron in any other country, never. Flying over 15,000 sorties, over 200 escort missions, the Tuskegee Airmen never lost an escorted bomber to the German Air Force. Now that record is being challenged today. It hasn't been denied, but it's being challenged today. I don't care what they say or what they may come up with. That record still stands, and it will still stand. And why did it take them over 62 years to challenge it now, when most of the men who said it are no longer with us? During that time, we only lost 66 men, and some of those were to training accidents. During that time, we had 33 shot down and captured as POWs, prisoners of war. But the Germans, were so enamored, they had such tremendous respect for the Tuskegee Airmen that they treated them with honor and respect. The Germans had a dossier on every Tuskegee Airman. They knew more about the Tuskegee Airmen than our own country did. They held them in the highest regard. They gave them a nickname I can't speak it in German, although I spent some time in Germany, but that was years ago. But in English, it's me, it calls the flying blackbirds. They honored them men. The Tuskegee Airmen. The greatest fighter pilots that this country has ever had. Now, ordinarily, you would say that's the end of the story. Well, you'd be wrong. And as Paul Harvey likes to say, now you're going to hear the rest of the story. There was another group of Tuskegee Airmen that the history books have been conveniently forgot to put in there. 
and they were members of the 477th Bombardment Group. These men were trained to fly B-25s. They were trained at Tuskegee. They were trained at Walterboro, South Carolina. Members of the 477th Bombardment Group. But these men never got a chance to go overseas because in 1945, we dropped a little thing called the atomic bomb on Japan and the war ended. And they never got a chance to go and prove how good they really were. But they like to tease the members of the 332nd fighter group, the fighter pilots, and they like to tell them, we were better pilots than you. Yeah, we were better than you guys. You only had one engine to worry about, we had two. Well, 1945, when members of the fighter group came back, some of them and some of the members of the 477th Bombardment Group were banded together and they were sent to a little airfield in Indiana called Freeman Field. And there, these fighter pilots decided, along with the members of the bomber group, I am no longer gonna be treated as a second class citizen by this country. So 100 of them got together and they decided to integrate the white officers club. They got arrested. They were gonna court martial them. But we had a new president by that time. President FDR had passed away. We got a new president, a gentleman by the name of Harry S. Truman. We used to affectionately call him, give him hell, Harry. And he was the president at the time, and Harry Truman stepped in and said, no, no, not this time. We're not going to do that. And he commuted the sentences, all except three. One of them was actually court-martialed and put out of the service. The other two, did, they didn't finish their court-martials. But this one that they did put out, got his court martial commuted years later. His record was cleared and he was paid all of his back pay. It was the action of these men, the Tuskegee Airmen, which was our first civil rights demonstration in this country. And because of their stand that they took, Harry Truman signed in 1948, Special Order 9811, desegregating the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, and the Marines. So you see, members of the 332nd hold a very special place in our history. And then there was a group of Tuskegee Airmen that if I had been old enough to be with the original group, because you see, I'm not original Tuskegee Airmen now. I'm old. But I ain't quite that old. Them guys are ancient now. But I would have been with this group. And I like to, I like to, I like to always tell them that I, I didn't really want to be a pilot. Mr. Eagleson, whose picture you see back there, was my road buddy. We traveled for over four years together. He was an original member of the 99th a greater guy you would never meet. He used to tease me all the time, him and A-Train and a few of the others. And they teased me and they said, if your mama had gotten busy a little earlier, you could have flown with us. And I look at them, I said, you are nuts. I wouldn't fly with you today. They were crazy. But I would have been with this group and they were the maintenance men and women of the Tuskegee Airmen, the maintenance people, maintenance the ones that keep them flying. It takes 10 people on the ground to keep one pilot in the air. Any pilot worth his salt will tell you, I am only as good as my crew, as my crew chief, as my maintenance people, the maintenance people. And then there was the most important group of Tuskegee Airmen of all. I have the honor of being the first narrator of the Tuskegee Airmen story to speak of these two groups, the maintenance people and this group. It's a very special honor and I cherish it highly. 
the most important group of Tuskegee Airmen ever. And they were the ladies of the Tuskegee Airmen. That's right. There were ladies. There were hundreds of them. They were nurses who were also pilots. They had to have their pilot training. They had to have pilot license. They were armament people. They were crew chiefs. They did everything the rest of the Tuskegee Airmen did except fly missions. The ladies of the Tuskegee Airmen. You don't read anything about them. They forgot to put them in the history books. Kind of forgot on purpose. But I got to talk to a very special one. She passed away. She lived in Richmond, Virginia. Her name was Macy. And she wouldn't talk about being a Tuskegee Airman, but the landlord of my house was a classmate of mine. We went to school together, and it was his aunt. And when he found out that I was a Tuskegee Airman, he called her and asked her, would I, could I come and interview her? She lived in Richmond, and she said, I'd be glad to, because now somebody is telling our part of the story. Two weeks before I was supposed to go, Miss Macy passed away. I never got a chance to talk to her the ladies of the Tuskegee Airmen. Because think about it, minute ladies. If it weren't for the ladies, there wouldn't be no Tuskegee Airmen. Am I right? Well, come on, let's get the ladies a hand here. <laughs> well, you can say that that's our story. There are some things I didn't tell you, and you'll get to ask questions. But there's a postscript to this story. Now I want you to stay with me. Because it's going to get a little rough. It's going to get real hard for this old man. You're going to get to see an old man cry. That's okay. I don't mind. I've told this story hundreds, maybe thousands of times. And there hasn't been one time when I didn't cry. The day before yesterday, I did it four times in one day. And my brothers here were sitting with me. And I told them, I said, I'm going to try not to cry this time. Didn't make it to the brother. I'm asked many times, why am I so close to the original members of the Tuskegee Airmen? I'll tell you why. In 1945, when they came home, America, our country that we love so much, America that they fought and died for. America did not see fit to tell the greatest flyers that this country has ever seen. They never told them, welcome home and thank you for a job well done. When they came back and they got off the ships in New York, Standing at the bottom of the gangplank, there was a white soldier. And when they got off, they told the Tuskegee Airmen, you ends go to the left. The white soldiers went to the right. And they took them downtown in New York and gave them a ticker tape parade down Broadway. The Tuskegee Airmen, they sent back to the south on segregated trains. I'm a Vietnam vet. I served three times in Vietnam. When we came home in the 60s and the 70s, America did the same thing to us. America has never told the Vietnam vet, welcome home and thank you for a job well done. They did it to the Tuskegee Airmen because of the color of their skin. 
they did not have a reason to do it to us. We didn't give them a reason because they did the same thing to black, black, white, red. It made no difference. America has never taken the time to tell the Tuskegee Airmen or the Vietnam vet, welcome home. So you see, I know what it means. And I know how it feels to love your country so much that you go to fight and die and then come home and they turn their back on you. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be all right. But you can help change that. You can really help change that. And here's how you can do it for us. When you meet a Tuskegee Airman, when you meet a Vietnam vet, do three things for us. Go up to them and shake their hand. If you feel strong enough about it, put your arms around them and give them a hug. And then tell them, welcome home. Because you see, America never has. And they owe us that and a whole lot more. Thank you and God bless you. Now, before I finish, this is something that we always do because it is special to us. Are there any veterans here that served in the Army, any branch of the service? Now, I don't care. I don't care how long you were there now. Any veterans at all? I don't care if you were done there 20 minutes. If there are any veterans at all, we want them to come up. We do a special thing for our veterans. Since there are not any, um, We'll let this beautiful lady here do what she needs to do. And I'd like to say that, again, thank you. And we have a question and answer period that if you want us to do, we'll be glad to do that. Thank you. I want to take this time before you go. Hawk, Robert, and Steve. Dave. Dave, thank you. And welcome home. Thank you. Here's my hug. <laughs> Thank you for that powerful, powerful story. And now it's time for questions. I guess we have, first have to gather ourselves and get our emotions together. But um, before you came, I was asking Mr. Hunter about the proce process, uh, Hawk, Hawk, he likes to be called Hawk, Hawk Hunter. And so tell us why they call you Hawk, that's one thing. Uh, and the second question is to uh, explain to us the process of um, your names you explained to us earlier today about how the records of the airmen, uh, that would be an interesting thing, I think, for the students to know about. This nickname of Hawk I got from a buddy of mine, a classmate, back in 1951. And we grew up together and we used to play cowboys and Indians. You know, y'all, your old folks, if you weren't born in the 50s. We used to play cowboys and Indians. And I have a thing about Indians. I love them. I love Indians. Always have. I studied them. And I used to, I taught myself to throw a hatchet, an axe. And of course, the Indians call it a tomahawk. Well, I got to be really good with it. And so they gave me the nickname Tomahawk. Well, as I grew older and we quit playing Cowboys and Indians, they just shortened the name. They dropped it, and the guys would always call me Hawk. Well, the girls in school would call me Tom. They didn't like that Hawk part. So they finally dropped that all together, and that's how I got my nickname, Hawk. If you come to Raleigh and you ask for Leonard Hunter, then some people will look at you like you're crazy. And you say, oh, do you know a guy by the name of Hawk? Oh, yeah, we know that idiot. Yeah, we know that crazy man. About the Tuskegee Airmen, their record, 
let me explain to you. When they decided that they were going to form this program called the Tuskegee Experiment, which now we have changed the name to the Tuskegee Experience for a very special reason that I'll tell you about in a minute. But when they decided that they were going to start this program, back in the 40s, the 30s, and the 40s, and the 50s, and it's this great nation of ours, and at some of our traditionally black universities and colleges, we had a program called the Pilot Training Program, Student Pilot Training Program. And there was one at uh, there was one at Tuskegee, there was one at A and T, there was one at Howard University, and there was one at West Virginia, and there was a few more I can't remember. Well, when these men and they were all college graduates, when they went to went to these schools, the first thing they did was to apply for this program, and they got into the program, the student pilots training program, and they all passed it and they got their civilian pilot license. And the first thing they did when they got their pilot license, they ran down to the Army Air Corps recruiting office and they raised their hand and said, I want to fight for my country. And the recruiter told them, say, I'm sorry, but uh, we're not hiding no colored pilots today. But we're going to put your name on the list. And if we start a program, we're going to call you first. Well, when Congress decided that they were going to have the Tuskegee experiment, guess who Congress called first? Yeah, that's right. They called them 30-some pilots. Now, they forgot about these guys was already licensed pilots. So, see, really, Congress blew it. That ain't nothing new. They've been doing it for now, and they're probably up there blowing some program right now that affects us. So they brought them in, and Mr. Eagleson and A-Train and some of the others that I've talked to extensively, they said when they got to Tuskegee and they had the white pilots came over from Randolph Air Force Base to train them, he said, we used to take them up and we did maneuvers that they had never seen before. Those colored boys, pilots, were better pilots than the men that were training them. They were better pilots. But we had a quota system, remember? And they wouldn't let them, we, would on, we could only have so many. So they was washing them out. They was washing out better pilots than the men that were training. But there was a gentleman that came on as commander down at Tuskegee. And his name was Noel Parrish. And he was a white colonel. And Colonel Parrish stopped that. And that's why we got to be so many black pilots during that time. Now, the reason it is called the Tuskegee experience now is during the time, during the Second World War, there was another experiment going on at Tuskegee. And people get the two mixed up. I don't, do y'all think I should tell? Okay, for you young people, they were taking black men. And when they would come back from overseas and some that had not gone overseas to fight for this country, when they would come back, they would take them down to Tuskegee to a hospital and there they would inject them with the syphilis virus to see how they would react. Many died. So people begin to associate that with the Tuskegee experiment. They were totally different. The Flyers knew nothing about that experiment that was going on. Eagleson said, we never, never even heard of it until it came out years later in history. So to keep down that confusion, our national headquarters officially changed it to the Tuskegee experience. And that is why we hear it. But when I tell the story, I tell it as the Tuskegee experiment, and that's why I clear it up. Question. Raise your hand. Come on now. 
Yes, sir. Uh, did any of the uh, Mustang airmen uh, score any aerial victories during the war? <laughs> the Tuskegee Airmen shot down 119 in, in aerial combat. They, they became so good at it that the, the Germans would not come up and fight. Now, you see us wear these red blazers. That is to honor them, and they were called the Red Tail Angels. You see the, the movie, the pictures back there. That is the reason why one of the crew chiefs, when they got their P-51s, and they, were, they weren't camouflaged. They were silver. They were real bright, clean, beautiful planes. And he went out, and he painted a tiny red strip down the, down the tail. And he asked one of them, he said, uh, Lieutenant, how do you like that? He said, it's not good, not big enough. Paint the whole damn thing red. So they painted the whole tail red, and they painted the spinner in the front where the propeller is. They painted that red. Why? They wanted the Germans to know who they were. And they became so good at shooting them out of the air that you could see that plane, and you could see the silhouette that the light would bounce, the sunlight would bounce off that silver plane, and you could see that bright red tail for miles. And when they would see that, the Germans would turn and go home. So when Eagleson and them would finish their escort duty with the B-17 bombers, and they would escort them to a certain point, and another fighter group would pick them up, they'd turn around and go back. And they'd go over the German airfields and buzz the airfields and try to get, up, get them to come up and fight. Well, they wouldn't come up and fight, so they shoot the planes up on the ground. They scored that many. There is another record that they tried to take from us. The Tuskegee Airmen shot down the first German jet, ME-262. That was done by a gentleman by the name of Roscoe Brown, Dr. Roscoe Brown. He's still alive today. He lives in New York. Roscoe Brown shot down the first German jet. They shot down three in one day. They came back the next day and they shot down three more. Questions? Talk to me. Test scores. Oh, yeah, the test scores. Remember I told you they had to take a series of tests, and they did. But when they got to Tuskegee, all of these pilots from over at Randolph didn't believe that black men were that smart. So they said them colored boys can't be that smart. Well, when they took the test the first time, nobody scored less than 95. Nobody. All of those men scored 95 or better. So when they got down to Tuskegee, they said, uh, we don't believe that. Make them take it again. So they did. And guess what they did? That's right. They scored the same thing all over again. And they had to say, well, I guess these colored boys are pretty smart. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us a little bit about the button on the shirt? What? These or these? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I can. The pins that you see around my lapel are pins that are from cities all over the country that I have appeared and told this story. They give me a pin to denote that I was at their city, California, North Dakota, all through North South Carolina, Florida, and especially here in North Carolina, Kitty Hawk, the Tuskegee Airmen have been inducted into the Kitty Hawk Hall of Fame there for the Wright brothers. These are the pins that I got. I have a lot more than this, but I ain't got no more room up there. These that you see I wear over my heart and that you see my brothers wear here, these are the awards that are given to us for our military service. They didn't give them to us. We earned them the hard way. They just don't give them to you. They range from Air Force Commendation Medal that I have, the sixth highest one you can get from the Air Force, to Good Conduct Medals from the Army and the Air Force. 
I don't know how I got them. Uh, Vietnam campaign ribbons. Vietnam battle ribbons with four battle stars. That means there were four major battles that I was in. Um, Korea, I was in the last part of Korea. So that's what these ribbons that you see me wear, David and Bob wear. Now, the picture that is being passed around is Mr. Wilson V. Eagleson, our hero. And he has a distinguished flying cross medal ribbon there that he got. Now, most people think he got that for flying with the Tuskegee Airmen. Wrong. No, he didn't. He shot down four German planes, but he didn't get it for that either. When he got out of the service, he was rifted out when the war ended. And he got out, and he was doing odd jobs. But he was always going down to the airfield. And his wife told him, said, well, since you like airplanes so much, why don't you go back in the service? So he did. But he came back in as a master sergeant. He became a crew chief on a C-119 cargo plane. Now, back in the 50s, we, were, we weren't there. Well, that ain't all together true, but we ain't going to go into that. Vietnam was called French Indochina. And the French were fighting the communist Vietnamese, the North Viet Vietnamese. And we were helping them. Wilson, Mr. Eagleson, and this crew would fly into the Philippines. They would take American markings off that plane and they'd put French markings on it. And they would fly to a, bay, a place in Vietnam called Den Ben Phu. And there they would kick out supplies to the Germans. I mean, the German boy, to the French. When they finished, they were on their way back out over the open sea. When they got over the South China Sea, a communist Chinese fighter plane jumped that C-119 and they shot it up. They hurt the pilot critically. They hurt the co-pilot critically. The crew thought that they were going to crash and die in the South because there was nobody left to fly the plane. And one of them remembered that Mr. Eagleson had been a pilot with the Tuskegee Airmen. They asked him, could he fly the plane? And Eagleson said, yeah, of course. He took the left seat, and the left seat is always where the pilot seat. He took the left seat, and he nursed that crippled C-119 all the way back to the Philippines, and he saved that whole crew. For that, he got the Distinguished Flying Cross. Questions? Yes? Um, what the Tuskegee <laughs> Were they out open to any race? No. The Tuskegee Airmen program was started, like I told you, to prove to America that colored men couldn't fly. So that was all that was there at the time. Well, when the war ended, the program ended, and they shut it down. Now you see we have my brothers here who are not black men. I think you can see that, can't you? Yeah. <laughs> They might as well be, because you couldn't find two greater ones anywhere. Anyone can join the chapter now. No race, no creed, no color. The only difference is, if you join, you are designated as different from the original Tuskegee Airmen. And to be original, you had to go through the Tuskegee experience. Other than that, there's no restrictions on you. When you get to be a certain age, you can become a Tuskegee Airman. All we ask in our chapter is that you learn the story. Now, you're not going to be able to tell it like I do. There are a few of them that can because I have a special way and I, I developed this for myself. But as long as you know the story, that's what you need to do. And that's all. Yes, ma'am. And in knowing the story, is it part of your... Uh, program for your chapter to do what you're doing here today yeah. to go to go. Yes, yes, yes it is. Um, I think our chapter here in North Carolina, we are the busiest chapter of any of the 44 chapters. We go more, well, I'm going to say we, me, now, because Mr. Eagleson is gone. I travel more than any of the, anybody else, all out of state, anywhere. I have not refused to go any place. 
and they got something like six chapters in California. And they asked me to come to California to tell the story. I said, you got six. They said, not like you tell it. But that's part of it. Yes, ma'am. Do the airmen still fly in combat? Oh, no. No, no. All of the airmen are in their late 80s and 90s. Um, Mr. Eagleson and I and other members of the chapter, we went down to Fort Bragg. And they have a simulator down there. And they let him get there and fly the simulator. All of us got a, a chance to, just like you're flying a regular airplane, and all of us got a chance. And they were amazed that he still had those skills, but he wouldn't do it. He still wouldn't fly. Uh, when he was 83, he did take the controls of a plane one time, a uh, Piper Cub type that was flying around, and he took the controls for about 10 or 15 minutes. But they'll all tell you now, they don't want no parts of it because they know they don't have the reflexes. And they still know how, but they, their, their reflexes and things like that, not anymore. They don't fly anymore. But they don't have any younger ones. Now it's more like an organization rather than... It is an organization, but the 332nd Fighter Group, the name, has been reactivated. And it is in uh, Kuwait. And members of the original group went over there to talk to the young, young people that manned the 332nd Fighter Group. The 99th Fighter Squadron, that was the first squadron to go over, has been reactivated, but it is a training squadron only. And that's, that's all they do. But they are so proud to have the name that people know. This was the original squadron. This was the Tuskegee Airmen, just like those. And the... The 332nd Fighter Group sent us a flag back from Kuwait during the first Gulf War. Yes? Of the um, Tuskegee Airmen that were shot down over Europe, um, the ones that were interned by the Germans in the POW camps, were they segregated from their white, uh, white counterparts? Or, and if they were uh, integrated with them, how did the... Um, the white airmen feel about having uh, black pilots interned with them. At first, they were segregated, but then they, they kind of brought them together. And let me tell you a little something about those white pilots, especially the B-17 pilots and the B-24 pilots. When America first started the war, they were losing 60 percent of the, of the bombers that went out. When the Tuskegee Airmen start flying escort duty, it dropped. It dropped. When we meet today a B-17 pilot or a, a, a family member, even to us that weren't even there, they come up to us and they just grab us and hold on. They cry and they say, thank you. I said, look, I wasn't old enough that they said, but you represent them. You represent them. Those men, some of them back there. Now, you must remember, this was in the 40s. And even till today, you can legislate how a person acts. But you doggone sure can't legislate how they think and how their heart works. So, yes, they did. They knew who they were. They were thankful. And if you see the movie, at the very end of the movie, when the Tuskegee Airmen were getting ready to to take the bombers all the way to Germany. And they were sitting there, and the white pilots were sitting in there in, in their briefing. And they were going to take another fighter group to escort them. And this white captain stood up, and he told his colonel, he said, Colonel, he said, if I got to go to Germany, he said, I want them colored pilots to take me. Oh, I'm not going. And from then on, from then on, B.O. Davis named his plane by request because the white pilots began to ask for the Tuskegee Airmen because they knew if they flew escort duty for them, they would come back home alive. Top Gun. Oh. How, many of you, how many of you have seen the movie Top Gun? Uh-huh. Yeah, OK. 
Okay. See some ladies' hands up there. Yeah, I know why, too. <laughs> yeah, the guy that was in the movie was the star. A little fella by the name of Tom Cruise. Uh, yeah, okay. So look, at, look at that smile on her face there. All right. Well, it was a great movie. But let me explain to you what Top Gun is. Top Gun is a competition that is done every year by the United States Armed Forces. It is a competition of fighter squadrons from the Army, Navy, Marines. Anybody that has a fighting squadron, fighter squadron can enter. Top Gun, a few years ago, they called members of the Air Force and the Air Corps and all of that, they call them to Washington, D.C. And they say, we want to upgrade the history of the United States Air Force. Now, remember what I told you about four-star generals? They want too bright. Here's a shining example. When they got there, they had members of the Tuskegee Airmen were there. And this general stood up and said, we don't know who won the first Top Gun Award. And a captain by the name that was in Tuskegee Airmen stood up. He told him, he said, we can tell you who won. We did. The Tuskegee Airmen won. And that general said, no, you didn't. He said, we don't have no record of it. No. So they kicked that back and forth for a few minutes. And the rest of the Tuskegee Airmen got up and walked out of the meeting at the Pentagon. And they went, to their air, they went back to the airport, got on their planes, and they flew home. And they got records. They got maintenance records. They got scorecards. They got pictures. And they flew back to Washington, D.C. And they went to the Pentagon, to that general's office, and they laid them on his desk. And they say, is that proof enough for you? Well, the Tuskegee Airmen were the first winners of the very first Top Gun Award. And here is the book that is published that proves it. 1949, at Nellis Air Force Base, Las Vegas, Nevada, the Tuskegee Airmen won the very first Top Gun Award. Here are pictures scored planes, pictures of the plane, and of all the crew. The man that stood up and told him his name was Tempton. And he died before this was published. Now it is in the history books. The trophy that you see on the front was found in the basement of a hangar at Wright Pat Air Force Base. Wright Pat wanted to keep the trophy. And they told the Air Force, we ain't going to give it up. Well, you know who won that battle. This trophy now is in the Smithsonian Institute with other memorabilia from the Tuskegee Airmen. We won the very first Top Gun Award. One other thing I'd like to pass on to you. They've never told them welcome home. But now they are going to give the Tuskegee Airmen their just due. They have been awarded the Congressional Gold Medal that is the highest civilian honor that can be awarded to anyone. The actual gold medal itself is going to be in the Smithsonian Institute. But they are going to give a bronze replica of that congressional gold medal to every member that went through the Tuskegee experiment. Everyone. For those who are no longer with us, it will go to their families. That ceremony is supposed to take place around the 19th of next month if everything goes the way it should. The Tuskegee Airmen are going to finally get their just due. Thank you. Thank you so much again for sharing that salient and poignant story, Hawk. Um, and also, before we dismiss, there's a display in the back of the artifacts and memorabilia from the Tuskegee Airmen. And we at UNCA want to thank you again for coming out and to Jerome for, um, we realize as educators that there is a big part of our history that's not in the books. So 
this is a special day for me, uh, for you to have this up close and personal experience. It's a special day. Thank you.